Joe Bloggs on the street could register and become a licensed football agent. That's the easy bit really. The the hard bit is actually getting the players. Part of it is is backing the right horses. If the player's not good enough, then it doesn't matter how much time and effort you're gonna put in, they're not good enough. If you're a very, very good player, it's the easiest thing in the world. How many contacts have you got? What contacts have you got? You know, who do you know at this club? Who do you know at that club? It's a little bit of a boys club, shall we say, in terms of selection and things like that. I think the top players in that league are probably on. It's whether they want to take a punt on trying to get to the WSL. But then underneath that, it starts to get a bit ropey. If a player's doing really well and a club is there and they're ready to go, basically, they can get them. Many different things you've got to consider if a contract's put in front of you. It's a funny game, it's a funny game. They see things and they think everything's brilliant, especially ones that they sign. Uh, how does someone become a football agent today? Today it's a bit harder than it was. So uh, before the 1st of January this year, um, anyone could become a football agent. As long as, as, long as you paid a fee, which is £600 a year. Um, you haven't been bankrupt, you haven't got a criminal record. Um, Joe Bloggs on the street could register and become a licensed football agent with the, the FA and represent players. Before 2016, you used to have to pass an exam that, that would be run by FIFA. And that obviously in my opinion was a good thing because you know it shows that you actually have to have a a level of knowledge in terms of the regulations to actually have the license they then scrapped that in 2016 why i don't know it might have been a money making thing because obviously then literally just opened up the floodgates and loads of thousands of people became agents and were paying this fee and um that's the only thing i can really think of in terms of why they would have scrapped an exam but then yeah they reintroduced the exam 1st of Jan, uh, from the 1st of Jan this year, you have to have passed the FIFA exam um, to be an agent with FIFA and then therefore also to to be an agent with the FA. So, so yeah, today you've got to pass that exam, which is pretty tough in all honesty. It's 20 questions. You've got to get 75%. So you've got to get 15 right out of the 20. They are multiple choice, um, but they're like, you know, when you get those multiple choice questions where the answers are very similar. So it's not like you can't blag it, um, but it is open book. So you can look at the resources you need. So I guess the what that's kind of showing is that you can be book smart, really. You know, if there's something you need to find out, can you find out the information from reading between the lines? And and yeah, so if you pass that exam, you, then you can obviously pay your, your fee and you can become a licensed agent with the FA um and then that's the easy bit really the the hard bit is actually getting the players so what got you into football agency so i've always been involved in football um you know i've got my coaching badges i've got the ua for b license so level three worked at academies um so football's always been been my thing um but when covid hit in particular um and everything kind of shut down and you know obviously coaching as we know it went out the window I did a lot of one-to-one -one, uh, training I started working with a lot of players like from more of a mentor capacity um, a lot more um, doing a lot of online stuff and I just found I had a lot more access to players and you know I felt that I could fit that role and I could be good in that role of almost being a sort of a mentor shall we say and obviously because I've got my experience in business you know i've had a business uh since 2013 um i kind of put the two together really i just felt that it's something i'd be very good at um in terms of supporting players not necessarily just with their football but obviously most importantly as an agent with the more business side with sourcing opportunities um contracts you know legal documentation things like that that you need to know to pass the exam um and you know i'm very passionate about helping players achieve what the potential they have would allow them to achieve just if they have a bit of help you know and a bit of support because I think a lot of players um, out there today they've got the potential they've got all of the ability um, but they make the wrong decisions in terms of you know 
clubs they might sign for, um, not knowing where to look in terms of, you know, levels. They don't really understand, you know, the system, shall we say, the pyramid. Um, they don't really understand contracts. They don't understand what, even like little things like what a seven-day approach is and things like that. Um, so, yeah, advising these players and helping them, supporting them, um, has always been something I'm quite passionate about. So why would a player have an agent? Well, I think in the male game, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's so much money involved that, you know, they, they need they need guidance, they need advice, they need someone to try and get them the best deal possible. Um, you know, because the money that's flying around in the male game is just astronomi- astronomical. Um, in the female game, it's an interesting question because it's, you know, it's one that if I speak to female players that are potentially interested um a lot of them have no idea what an agent actually does they don't really understand how it works um and why it benefits a player to have an agent i think anywhere where there's money involved or there's money to be made then it makes sense to have somebody um oversee that side of things if you're a football player because you've got enough to worry about as it is in terms of your performance and staying on top of things in relation to the football side, um, to have somebody that represents you and does all of the sort of dog work, shall we say, um, leg work, um, who's speaking to the clubs on your behalf, drumming up interest, trying to get you the best deal possible, trying to trying to secure endorsement deals, albeit that's quite difficult in the women's game because it's not quite as established yet. Um, you know, basically in a nutshell, it's taking care of business on behalf of the player. You know, for a player, for me, it's a no-brainer, you know, to have an agent because, you know, they're going to source opportunities. They're going to try and get them the best deal possible. And like I say to players, it's difficult for players to try to negotiate their own thing because they find themselves in a situation where they don't want to come across a certain way, maybe to officials at a club. Whereas if they leave it to an agent, their representative it comes across a lot more professional a lot more business like and it kind of you know it sends a message to the manager the head coach the 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 officials at the club that you know you know I just want someone else to take care of it I don't want to be involved in those kind of talks because of how it might how I might be perceived so I think it's also very professional for players to have um an agent in in this in this age when when the money's there and you know when, and when the money's to be made i mean obviously if there was no money in, involved then then you know of course there's there's no need to have an agent a bit like non league non league players in the male game there's no need for them to have an agent because there's no real money in it i mean and you know anyone on the street really can negotiate or knows the basics of negotiation um in terms of you know trying to get as much as they can it's not rocket science so you know certain levels of football you don't need an agent you might even just need somebody that can source opportunities for you but when you're signing contracts and you know there's a salary at stake that's when I think players benefit from having an agent a lot of players can't get an agent or won't be able to get a good agent only a charlatan a lot of players might want an agent but you know a lot of good agents aren't going to just represent anyone they have to represent the right players yeah, 100%. So I think part of the game is obviously, as they say, back in the right horse. So, you know, from from our side, when you sign a player, obviously you're, you're committing a certain amount of effort and time to that player. Um, but at the same time, if the player's not good enough, then it doesn't matter how much time and effort you're going to put in, they're not good enough. And you can open as many doors as as you as you want if they're not if they're going to walk into these clubs go and do a training session player friendly game and and the, the the head coach turns around and says they're not of the level then you know what can you do so so yeah part of it is is backing the right horses um and you know having that eye really and having a having a sort of understanding of talent um and what's needed another side of it is exactly that is it's not just about finding the players it's about knowing what clubs need what so, for example, you might not have the player, but if you know a club needs a certain type of player, you might therefore go out and find that player. So so it can work both ways. But yeah, in terms of having an agent, um, I think it all depends on uh, the level of the agent as well. So if there's an agent that's just starting out, 
then obviously they're not going to have the pick of the crop in terms of the players because a top, top player is probably going to go with more of an established agency, which is half the battle actually in this industry in terms of the competition. Is like, I could be the best agent in the world and I could say to you or your son or your daughter, I know 100% fact you will not find a better person to represent you than me because I've got football knowledge, I've been involved in the game, I've got business experience, you know, blah, 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 all these things that I know the average person that's, that's an agent at the moment doesn't have. And I know that for a fact. But how do I get that across to you without you looking at my roster and saying, oh, well, he represents that, that player, so he must be good. You know, so when you start out in this industry, it's very, very difficult because you haven't got any kind of track record so if a player looks at you and they're like, you know what, I like this guy. I would like to see him represent me in a boardroom. I think the way he communicates would be good for me to get the best deal or whatever. Even if they think that, if they see that you don't represent a player of a certain level, um, they're going to have their doubts. And that's the challenge you've got to overcome. So, so getting an agent... You know, if you're a player and you're struggling to get an agent, there will be agents out there that need to get players on their books when they're starting out. So they're probably the agents that you want to be looking for. Um, and then, you know, it's like any in any walk of life, the better you are, the more um, attention you're going to get. And like I've said many, many times, if you're a very, very good player, it's the easiest thing in the world. You know, like... I don't even need to have what the what they call this black book. You know, you heard, must have heard of that, like a black book in terms of how many contacts have you got? What contacts have you got? You know, who do you know at this club? Who do you know at that club? I'm not being funny, but if if you've got a very good player, anyone could anyone could find out the contacts they need at a certain football club to get that player in the door through the door if the player's good enough. You know, so it all comes down to whether you've got players that are good enough. Um, and not only that, but understanding whether you have or not, because some agents, unfortunately, they can, what's the expression? Um, flog a dead horse. Not even flog a dead horse. What's that expression? Rose tinted glasses or something. You know, they, they, they see things and they think everything's brilliant, especially ones that they sign. But, you know, sometimes you've actually got a smell the coffee and actually realise when a player might not be of the level that's actually gonna make you commission basically because the reason why we do this is obviously to get players the best deal possible and therefore commission um, so yeah I mean it is hard to get an agent but then at the same time it depends on the where the agent is in terms of their journey and also how good the player is at the end of the day uh, you know whether they're young whether they're established you know what their potential is. Um, so, yeah, it's a funny game. It's a funny game. What is the benefit of a player signing a contract? Well, I mean, in terms of... It all depends on the level. Um, so, you know, the, the purpose of a contract, obviously, is for the club to, to lock in the player's services, obviously, for a period of time. Um, and then from the player's side, it's locking in a payment schedule, basically, for a period of time. So, you know... I think there's many different things you've got to consider if a contract's put in front of you. So, first of all, absolutely first of all, is this club, especially if you're a young player, is this club the best place for you to be in this moment in time in terms of for your football? Are you going to play week in, week out? Um, because, you know, you've still got a lot to do and you've still got a lot to showcase in the market. And if you're... Yes, you might sign a contract that might guarantee you a certain amount of money over a certain period of time. But at the end of the day, if you're not playing football, um, it's only that contract is only the value that you're going to get for that period of time. And then after that, you know, you're going to very much struggle to have that next move and, and to kick on. So, so, you know, when you sign a contract, you need to make sure that you're in the right place from a football side of things. Um, obviously the benefits of signing a contract are you're guaranteed that money for that period of time so so you know if your agent can get you a good deal and you can sign that contract for multiple years then I guess from a financial point of view um, it's, it's security right um, from the club side 
if they really believe the player is a good player and you know is an asset and they can either have them to help them with their performances and and or um sell them on then you know they want to lock that player in otherwise they might lose the player for nothing so i think it's about security really um and you know i think if you're comfortable with the club and you think it's a good club for you from a football point of view and you think that you're getting paid your worth then you know of course i think it's it's good to sign a contract because you're guaranteed that money um but yeah you've got to have a lot of things lined up for it to to be signed and i think that's why obviously having an agent massively helps because you, they can advise you and they can maybe see things from a different perspective um maybe maybe ask questions that you wouldn't even think to ask um and yeah i think i think contracts are obviously becoming more and more prominent in the women's game now um because clubs understand that if they don't lock in the best players then they're just going to go on a on a seven day approach I mean, a lot of clubs do what's called a one plus one, so they'll they'll have the option for the club to trigger the second year. Um, that isn't disastrous because I feel that the club are only going to trigger the second year if the player's done well for them. So you could argue that if they trigger the second year, it means that the player's done well, therefore the player should be happy, and and you know it's it's not it, it shouldn't be the end of the world. Um, if they don't trigger the second year, then obviously the player's free to go and that's when the agent would come in and obviously try to source them new opportunities. What is a release clause and how does that work in a contract? So a release clause is pretty much what it says on the tin. Um, it's a figure that's put into the contract whereby if a club makes an offer of that amount, then it basically automatically releases the player from the contract and the, the club that holds the contract can't stand in the way of the player going. Um, you know, we've put in a number of release clauses with our female players this summer that have signed contracts because, you know, where where release clauses are very useful um, is if a player's doing really well and they're in a very rich vein of form. And let's say, for example, a club at a higher level, especially around sort of the new year time where they might be looking at the table and thinking we've got a real chance here of getting promoted or whatever. Um, and we might need a bit of, extra firepower and they they see your player that's doing really well and that's that's a, that's a player that they feel they need and they want for this particular time um if you didn't have a release clause then obviously they wouldn't be able to sign them until the end of the contract so having a release clause at least if a player's doing really well and a club is there and they're ready to go basically they can get them without the club that holds the contract obviously standing in their way so so yeah, we try to put a release clause in um, the contracts and generally clubs will kind of agree to a release clause being the value of the contract and basically the value of what they're investing in the player. Um, so yeah, that's what a release clause is and it will go in in the contract um, and it might go in alongside you know goal bonuses and things like that. So what's the current state of the female game? The female game, well, I mean the female game, you've obviously got the WSL at the top which is where all, all of the the spotlight is and therefore the money. Um, you know, it's it's what's making the money in terms of revenue from the, the TV rights and sponsorship. Therefore, you know, the players, the players playing in the WSL, they're earning a decent salary, shall we say. You know, full-time, probably earning around sort of average 40, 50K a year. So a decent salary. I think the top players in that league are probably on, you know, your six figures, maybe a couple of hundred grand a year. But then underneath that, it starts to get a bit ropey, if I'm honest with you. So, you know, you've got the championship, which is full time. So they expect the players to be full time. Um, they train full time. Average salary in the championship is probably around 20 grand. Um, if you're lucky, sort of 30, maybe bordering 40 potentially for the top top players but on average from what i've been seeing it's around 20 grand so you know the problem you've got with the women's game is you know the clubs are it's it's whether they want to take a punt on trying to get to the wsl so some owners um are putting in a lot more money than others um the budget differential in the championship is huge you've got some clubs that are paying you know, players are barely making a grand a month. Um, and then others, you know, they're doing okay. So 
in the championship it's a it's a bit it's a bit of a tricky one because you know whilst players can't go out and have a nine to five job because they're expected to train in the day they're not necessarily getting paid what the the players are getting in the WSL so the jump between those two leagues is huge in terms of income that they that they can make and and to be honest with you in terms of interest and in terms of uh attention and spotlight um you know the WSL's got a big profile now you know it's launching on Friday I believe the first game of this season on BBC2 or most of the games are live so you've got that revenue from the TV um and then if you go to step 3 I mean blimey step 3 is a bit of a wild west situation you've got the northern prem and the southern prem um and you know like I say the ambition of the ownership of the clubs is it it varies a lot you know, you've got clubs that are paying full time. They're on a full time model, um, and they are paying quite a lot of money to players. And you, you've got some clubs that are literally doing a training session on a couple of nights a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, whatever. The players are getting paid pretty much expenses. So you know, but they're all competing in the same league. So, so yeah, the women's game, it's I wouldn't say it's in the best of of spots at the moment, but I think with people like myself that are involved in it I mean what we see as is a long-term thing because obviously the hope is that in a few years time especially with this new co that have taken over the WSL and the championship they're going to try and commercialize it and bring more money into it um, and then hopefully you'll see that money trickle down and there'll be more money for players in step three potentially step four um, I think we're we're hoping that in you know three four years time the industry will be it will be booming and if you start to work in it now and you start to build your contacts and you start to get your roster going then obviously you'll be in a better position for it it's still it's still growing obviously as an industry it's still got a lot to learn the women's game and um and you know mistakes will be happening along the way um and hopefully hopefully it will it will sort of stabilize and start to grow from a business capacity down the leagues below the wsl